Thank you for the opportunity to present a very brief lecture on the economics of Red Plus. Of course, in a 10 minutes small presentation, I only will be able to touch a few of the key issues and hopefully give an overview of the things. Now, economics of Red started out, or I should say, Red started out as implementing a very simple textbook idea from the environmental economics textbook. And the idea is something like this. We want to create a, what I call a multi-level payment for environmental services system, where we from the international level at the top of the screen can move down um, funding for emission reduction to the national level. So we pay countries, we, the developed countries, pay the developing countries for doing emission reductions here. Now, this system is supposed to be mirrored at the national level within Brazil, Indonesia and other countries in red payments to the land users, to local governments, to communities, maybe to projects. And again, this exchange of payments for emission reductions. That was the core idea of RED. Now, I should say that we also could have done this in another way. Now, the, normally what we, the way we deal with a with a uh, environmental problem, a pollution problem, an externality within economics is to introduce a tax. At least that's a textbook recommendation. So we could have taxed emission reductions. This did not happen in red. And the main reason is that the countries and the, the, those who deforest are considered poor and therefore it's not politically acceptable to do that. Now, but because we have chosen one particular way, the payment for environmental services rather than taxing pollution as the main system for doing red, it will create some problems when we come back to the questions of should we use development aid money to pay a hacienda owner of 100,000 hectares in the Amazon for reducing emission reductions. Red has changed a lot over the last seven, eight years since it was launched in Bali in 2007. It has changed along three key dimensions. Now, first, uh, it has changed the scale. Initially, it was thought as a payment between countries, and many still think of Red as a payment between countries. Secondly, it was an aim focused on carbon benefits and emission reduction, because that is, after all, the mandate of the of the UN Convention on Climate Change. It's carbon and it's not all the other objectives that have been added, development, biodiversity, we have other conventions for that. So some would still say that okay, REN should focus on carbon, that's the mandate within UNFCCC, whereas others say we need to broaden it. Now the third dimension that has changed is that we have moved from PES, uh, a PES focus to have this much more broader policies, what is called PAN policies and measures. So the original red idea is important still and with us as a payment at the international level, but a lot of the action today is at local and national level and with a focus on both carbon and non-carbon benefits and a broad set. I think it's important because a lot of what you see in the debate is a kind of a discrepancy between the original idea and the current action where it is. And sometimes we talk so much about the idea that we also think that that is what's going on on the ground and it's not. On this by and large it's not. Now a very good exam question in economics to ask what does it take to create a market? Now basically you need four elements. You need something to buy and sell, a commodity or a service. You need sellers, you need buyers, and you need a marketplace with rules and regulations or institutions, as we call it. Now, if you take this to red, we have for the commodity or service, the certified emission reductions or the verified emission reductions. Um, we need a couple of things to do that. We need to measure the actual emissions and we need to compare them to a reference level. And the difference between the actual and the reference level, that is what is called an emission reductions. Secondly, we need to have some sellers here. And, and who sh should they be? That's a question of who has the rights to the carbon in the trees. But it's, it's more complicated than that, because an emission reduction can be due to a national policy reform. For example, you are deciding not to build a road. Indonesia is, is uh, 
has its moratorium on forest conversion and who's to be attributed to that? Is it the palm oil companies that do not get the licenses? Is it the government? Is it the forest communities around the forest that is not being converted? So since we're talking about avoided deforestation, the attribution problem is a big question, even difficult in theory, and not to talk about practice. The third element here is the buyers. Who should they be? Now, the original idea was to have what's called a cap system, a cap and trade, like we have in the Kyoto Protocol. That has not happened. Maybe it will not. We'll see what's happened in Paris at the end of this year. Most of it has been more than 90% or roughly about 90% has been from development aid. And then you have a small from the voluntary market. And finally, you need the institutions in place with the rules, the standards, the verification, so we don't get fake emissions, for example, by setting the reference levels incorrectly or by simply having fraud, as we also have seen both in this market and other markets. Now, the change that we have seen in red, why has it happened? Just a few points on this. I think first the practical question that to do really small scale monitor and verification is really, really hard. Setting reference level is hard in theory. PES is also very expensive. If you think about a scheme where we go for a 50% emission reductions uh, globally and we pay $5 per ton and we set reference level at historical deforestation level, say the past 10 years then we are talking about 12, 13 billion dollars every year. And that's more than the accumulated funds uh, committed to RED so far. There's also a lot of ideological opposition, anti-market. I think I agree with some of the market critique, but it also has ideological elements. And what we then see is that most of the RED systems are far from the textbook and the question is, will they be effective? Go a little bit back on the simple economics of deforestation. It's a model that has followed me and been my academic bedfellow for the last 20 or so years. And I think it's still the most useful approach to do when we discuss deforestation. Now, the simple idea is this. Land is put into the use with the highest land rent or profit to the landowners or the land manager. So deforestation simply happens because non-forest uses are more profitable than forest uses. So it's a race between these two rents, the agricultural rent on the one hand and the, and the forest rent on the other. So there are three basic ways of doing this as I illustrate in, in the next uh, graph here. Now, if you start with this agriculture rent, one, we can start reducing that. So deforestation takes place because we have a positive agriculture rent. And in an open access system, we can ignore the forest rent because that is not being captured by, by the, the person who is converting the forest to agriculture. If we then introduce private property and say, okay, there are some benefits from forestry from keeping there and taking on the trees in the future. So we introduce a private forest benefit and that will reduce the deforestation. Some of this marginal land that would be deforested in an open access system is now being conserved because it's in the landowner's interest. Now we can go a bit further and say that we also introduce a community system where the community set the rules or even own the forest. Now in this system the community benefits will also be taken into account in the decision making and reducing deforestation even further. And finally we can say that also the global, the carbon benefits should be introduced. Now you should notice that private property or community property, in both these systems, there is no incentive for the private or the community users to include the climate benefit because they are the global level. So we need a PES system that really rewards them for doing that. So if you go to these three sectors, let me briefly go through that. If you, in the agriculture sector, the very basic idea would be make agriculture less profitable. Remove subsidies and support, keep them poor and make it unattractive to live there. That is a possible idea, but you all will recognize the big problem of doing that, namely that there is a trade-off between poverty and development objectives. Um, therefore, what has been suggested is to have more of what's so-called place-based policies, where you distinguish between the intensive and the 
extensive sector. So you should focus on the intensive agriculture and keep that expanding and not the agriculture that will expand at the expense of forests. Also here we can talk about trade-off. Now the latest is or so-called climate smart agriculture. Well, it's not a, a very recent idea. It has been around for a long time, and I refer to that as the Bourlow hypothesis. Increase the yield because then you can produce the same amount of food on a smaller area. The problem is this: the demand is not fixed. So increasing the yield, you also make it more profitable to encroach it. So even with climate smart agriculture, we cannot take it for granted that it will lead to reduce pressure on forests. There are a set of other policies. Tenure is one of them. And I, I have two things to say about tenure that maybe it will provoke someone, and that's good because it may help us to rethink if we are provoked. I think those who have said that no red, or sorry, no tenure, no red is a wrong starting point. I think we need to have both reforms, but tenure is slow and you can do a lot without tenure reforms. Tenure is important if you want to have a pest system. Then it's critical to know who should be rewarded. And it can also help to protect some of the forest. But at the same time, I think it's two separate tracks. They are linked to each other, but lack of progress in one area should not be an excuse for not implementing the other on tenure. So tenure is a good condition. It often helps, but not always, to reduce deforestation. And we can do a lot even without completing that long-term project as tenure reforms. Roads and infrastructure, I have a quote here that you can read. I think it's a critical point and really have more environmental or forest impact assessment of that. Protected areas, you'll be surprised to hear how many economists that talks highly about protected areas that although it's of course far from perfect, it is quite often quite effective in protecting forests. Not 100%, but it is one of the best tools in our toolkit. Let me conclude by a few summary points here. I think first the key red idea, economic incentives, and I think it matters. If you're a poor farmer or even a rich hacienda owner or a palm oil company owner, economic incentives matter to you. So red was about changing incentives, so that's the idea we should keep. But we have also learned that creating these good incentives is extremely hard. And we have also learned that not just incentives matter. For example, if a system is perceived as fair, if it is politically backed for that reason, to address the drivers that may be easier than to create a pest system and even more effective, and we have the direct regulations. Now, sometimes people ask if I'm supporting red, and I say, yes, I support it. And I think it's very important to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation because I think climate change is real. So to me, red is an objective. So when people say they are a bit skeptical of red, I don't I first have to ask what do you mean by red? To me, red is an objective, but it's also a huge policy experiment that we should learn from and be very pragmatic about it. I think there are certain elements that are good and worth conserving, like the national approach, like focus on economic incentive, but we should also be pragmatic and test and see what works and what does not. So good luck with the experiment and with that testing. Thank you.